This is Radio Ego Shock with Alex Smith. He set the climate conversation on fire with his 2017 article in New York Magazine, where he is deputy editor and climate columnist. Now American journalist David Wallace Wells is back with his new book, The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming. David, welcome to Radio Ecoshock. Thanks for having me. Well, before you wrote the most popular article in New York Magazine, you covered the new science beat, stuff like gene editing, robots, sometimes the arts. David, what turned you into a climate columnist? I was just seeing so much scary news from the scientific research that I felt wasn't being written about properly or honestly in most places like the place that I worked. And I felt, as a kind of consumer of that news, frustrated that, say, when I read accounts of climate change in the New York Times and Washington Post, even accounts that I admired, I felt that there were um, they were shying away from some of the scarier possibilities and turning away from some of these storytelling opportunities that those possibilities opened up. And I felt that there was a, a big gap there that needed to be filled from a narrative point of view. It needed to be filled from a political point of view. It needed to be filled from, you know, the perspective of advocacy and, and hope for making a difference with the planet. And for all those reasons, yeah, I started writing a kind of more um, cinematic and maybe alarmist kind of way about climate change, which is how I saw it. Um, and that's led me to where I am now, which is writing this book that is, you know, not just about the science, but about all of the ways that our life promises to be transformed by climate change if we don't do anything about it. So that's politics and geopolitics, culture and relationship to technology, our perspective on capitalism and all that. Um, I do think that there's basically nothing, no life on the planet that will be untouched by climate change over the next few decades and no aspect of life either. That's how total it is. That's how all-encompassing it is. And we haven't really yet begun to think about what it will mean for the way that we live. Um, my, my book is a kind of effort to, to do that. I love that you've done that. I interview a lot of climate scientists, but they can't really put in that social perspective. Okay, this is what life could be like if what I'm saying is true. Yeah, and it's it's quite horrifying, really. When you look squarely at the science, you see that the impacts are quite dramatic and quite punishing. You know, if we're on track for four degrees of warming by the end of the century, which is the kind of conventional view of the UN, IPCC, and other bodies, that will mean probably hundreds of millions of climate refugees. It will mean the total loss of probably all Arctic Arctic ice, although that'll take centuries to unfold. Um, it'll mean a global GDP that could be 20% or more smaller than it is today, uh, more than twice as much war than we have today. Um, just about everywhere you look, there are completely crippling, horrifying impacts that we're scheduled to encounter as a result of this warming. And I think as a result, many people, even those people who are kind of concerned about climate change, tend reflexively to look away because these outcomes are horrifying and they're also almost impossible to believe because you can't really square them with an understanding of the modern world as it exists today. And I think that that's, you know, natural response. It's a human response. It's a response that I have myself sometimes. But I also think it's an irresponsible one because if the science is telling us that the future is going to be so different that the modern world that we take for granted can't endure as it is, we shouldn't assume that the modern world will endure and the science is wrong. We should take seriously what those scientists are telling us about just how fragile our contemporary infrastructure is and just how damaged it could be by these forces, which is really significantly. Just this month, you told The Guardian newspaper, people should be scared. I'm scared. There are new nuclear weapons on the horizon, angry terrorists, a really suspect president, and plastic in our guts. We live in scary times. So why freak out about climate change in particular? My view is that it is the story. It is the big threat. It is the one that contains all the other challenges that we face. And by that, I mean, whatever your political commitments, whether you're concerned about income inequality or, you know, gender equality, whether you're concerned about domestic assault or crime, whether you're concerned about mental health issues, all of these things are touched by climate change, some of them quite dramatically. So, you know, we know that for every degree of warming, grain yields will fall by about 10 percent. That means if we get to four degrees of warming, we could have agricultural yields that were half as bountiful as they'd be without climate change. 
We're not living in a world that is without hunger now. Climate change is only going to make that worse. We're not living in a world without conflict now, but for every half degree of warming, we'll see between 10 and 20 percent increase in conflict. So if we get to four degrees, we'll have, as I said earlier, probably as much as twice as much war. And those temperature impacts happen at the individual level, too. So assault, robbery, rape, everything about the way that we live in the world will be affected and in most cases deformed. And as a result, I've come to see really over the last few years, this isn't how I saw it a few years ago, but I see it now as the entire system in which we live, the theater in which we conduct all of these other experiments, political, social, romantic, cultural, and the terms of those experiments are set by climate. I used to think as a New Yorker, as a lifelong urbanite, that I lived outside of nature that it was nature was something that happened when I went on vacation and looked out the window. But the more I understand about climate science, the more I realize, it sounds so naive to say, but the more I realize we live within nature. You walk down the street, even in the most advanced city in the world, you're living within nature. And because you live within nature, you're living within climate change. And when you think in particular about the economic effects and the effects on conflict, you understand that you know this is not a story about coastlines and sea level rise. It is touching absolutely every aspect of the way that we live on the planet. We haven't really yet reckoned with that. We haven't really begun to think about what it means that we are now living on a planet that is warmer than has ever been the case in the entire history of humanity. So no human has ever walked a planet as hot as this one. To me, that means it's an open question whether humans would have ever evolved in the first place if the planet had always been this hot. I think they probably would have, but it's a question. And certainly whether we would have developed agriculture and through agriculture civilization if the planet had always been this hot, because the parts of the world where we did invent agriculture, the Middle East, are now suffering from terrible droughts and famines as a result of climate change. That gives you a sense of just how precarious this whole experiment, this whole human experiment, which people like me, as a kind of child of the 90s, a child of the end of history, were led to believe were permanent, eternal, unending, triumphant, how actually precarious all of what we know as modern life is and how vulnerable it is to disruptions from the climate, which are getting more intense by the day. And over the course of decades, if we don't change course, we'll become really dramatically more intense. Chris Hayes on MSNBC says covering climate is a ratings killer. And you just passed through a long row of interviews about your new book. David Wallace-Wells, what is your assessment of the state of media coverage on climate change? Do they get it now, or is it just a sensational new draw? I think things are changing actually quite rapidly on this point. For a long time, there was a kind of narrow consensus among scientists and as a result among journalists about what kind of story it was responsible to tell about climate change. And the recent upsurge in activism and the recent IPCC report, among other factors, have really opened up this space so that we're hearing from many more voices telling many different kinds of stories. And even in the kind of state establishment institutions, we're seeing a much higher volume of coverage of climate because the world is waking up to it and the media responds to audience. One reason we're seeing that is just many more people are concerned, they're engaged, they want to read stories about it, and nobody thought that that was possible a few years ago. I think the change is in part because of new kinds of storytelling, but it's also just because the political winds are blowing in that direction. Um, The sort of gold standard for public opinion about climate comes from Yale. They do an, an opinion survey. And the number of Americans who believe climate change is real and happening now is 73%. The number of Americans who are concerned about climate change is 70%. Those numbers are up each about 15% since 2015, and they're up about 8% since March. So things are moving quickly, and you see that very clearly in the activism, in the kind of grassroots activism with Greta Thunberg and the climate strike in Europe, with Extinction Rebellion, with the Green New Deal even in the U.S. It's um, Our politics are moving very, very quickly because our public opinion is moving quickly. And I think our media is playing along. It's, um, it's along for the ride. It's wanting to tell the story of our time as more and more people see it as the story of our time. Critics say we shouldn't frighten people. It just numbs them into inaction. You said fear may be the only thing that saves us. How could that work, David? Well, I think about my own experience. So I was somebody who was concerned about climate as an average American liberal, generic, relatively well-off American liberal, concerned about climate change, but thought it was one issue among many we were facing, and I had some faith that our leaders would take action on it. I've come over time to see 
as I was saying before, just how all-encompassing this threat is, how dramatic it is, and how much it promises to punish us and the lives of our children and our grandchildren if we don't take action. And I've been awakened out of that complacency by fear. When I look around the world, when I look around my, you know, my friends, my colleagues, when I walk down the street, when I watch television, it seems really transparently the case to me that complacency about climate change is a bigger problem than fatalism about climate change. And for that reason, I think that fear can be a helpful motivator because it did that it played that trick on me. It pulled me out of complacency and made me engaged. But I think you also see that in the social science. Um, there was a big paper that was published in Nature at the end of 2017, actually, in response to my New York Magazine article earlier in that year that surveyed all of the literature about climate messaging and said that despite what scientists may have told you, that there's really only one responsible way to talk about climate using notes of hope and optimism. In fact, basically, all kinds of storytelling are useful. You can't predict who will respond to what kind of story. And so there's no need to edit your approach um, beforehand, including with alarm. And when I look back on the history of environmental advocacy and ad- activism, I see many, many instances of you know, when fear and alarm were useful in mobilizing public opposition. You know, most notably, perhaps, Rachel Carson and Silent Spring That book was decried as alarmist and hyperbolic and uh, misleading when it was first published. It led to the eradication of DDT, which was a huge advance. It almost single-handedly led to the creation of the EPA, which is also hugely important. And when we talk about public campaigns across the spectrum from, you know, against carcinogenic pesticides, against nuclear proliferation, against cigarette smoking... But uh, we we can't live in a continual state of panic or fear. I mean, uh, let's say we don't go to fake optimism. What can really follow? Is it despair? Is it action? What? It seems sort of intuitive that alarmism can lead to action. You know, the U.N., in its report from October, said that to avoid catastrophic warming, what we needed was a global mobilization of the scale of World War II. We know that that war was fought out of fear and alarm, not out of hope and optimism, um, although there were notes of hope and optimism in that. And I think we need that kind of action, that scale of response now. I think that's what the scientific community tells us, and I think we should credit it. Now, exactly what form that takes, I'm not yet entirely sure, but I have to say I'm really heartened by how much movement on this issue has happened in American politics, which was long held up as a global laggard on this issue. Um, The Democratic Party has moved dramatically on climate just over the last few years. And because, you know, the polling on public opinion has moved so much, it's hard to imagine the Republican Party won't respond to. um, The question is whether they'll do so and come around quickly enough to really avert our worst case outcomes. And on that point, I'm, you know, I'm a bit agnostic or even skeptical, unfortunately. But, you know, for me, whether you call the response to the science fear or alarm or urgency or aggressive action. These are, to me, semantic distinctions. The important thing is to understand that we're facing a threat that is global, existential, and all-touching. Whatever looking at that science makes you feel or do is a good and proper response. We shouldn't hide from it. We should learn from it and take action on the basis of it, which means really dramatically even radically reimagining much of the way we do business in the world. Um, Everything that we do from the time we get up in the morning to the time we go to sleep has some kind of carbon footprint, and we need to do everything we can to reduce that impact as quickly as possible. So the more dramatic the response, I think the better, and especially if that dramatic response can put pressure on our policymakers so that they can take aggressive action. That's really the best path forward because – for all the virtue in living within a small carbon footprint as an individual, the impact of one life is really ultimately trivial to the big problem. The important thing, the most important thing, is political change, and that happens through mobilization and simply voting. This is Radio EcoShock. My guest is New York Magazine Deputy Editor and Climate Columnist David Wallace-Wells. We are talking about his new book, The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming. Now, David, when I picture what you mean by uninhabitable, I also picture the actual land space of Earth shrinking due to sea level rise. You know, deltas will be invaded and uh, storm surges will wash into existing cities and make some of them useless. Is that the sort of thing that you are also talking about in your book? There are many contributing factors. I should say I don't think that totally uninhabitable Earth is 
likely any time on any time scale it makes sense to imagine. So over the next number of centuries, I don't think it will be the case that you know humanity will be made extinct by climate change. But it is conceivably possible, and the fact that we've brought it into the realm of conceivability, even if it's vanishingly unlikely, is a kind of dramatic indictment of the way that we've behaved over the last couple of decades. And I should say one of the big points of emphasis in the book is really just how quickly we've done this damage. So we, we often think of climate change as the legacy of the Industrial Revolution. So we think of it as being several centuries old, but half of all the carbon emissions that we've put into the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels have come in the last 30 years. So that's since Al Gore published his first book on warming. It's since the premiere of Seinfeld. We're really doing this damage in real time. And what that will mean to the map of the Earth is transformative on every level. So you mentioned coastlines, you mentioned the flooding of deltas, but it will also increase deserts. It will make what was once quite bountiful agricultural land much less bountiful. It will increase the um, footprint of wildfires so that by the end of the century, if we stay on our current emissions course, it's predicted that California wildfires will burn 64 times as much acreage as they burned this past year when they burned more than a million acres, 64 times as much. And there are those kinds of impacts just about everywhere you look, the melting of glaciers, you know, the impact on animal life and and their ecosystems, the effect on plant growth. Some places, in some ways, heat increases plant growth. In other ways, it damages it. But the whole shape and context and face of the planet will be impacted by these forces. And we're only beginning with extreme weather and wildfires in particular to understand really just how total that impact will be. But as you say, it's, it's, it's everywhere you look. We're hearing more about mass death and extinctions in the insect world. And on February 20th, CNN reported a small brown rat in Australia is the first mammal known to have gone extinct directly due to climate change. David, do you share my worry that a lot is happening in the miniature world with the small creatures that we just don't know about, and that could pile up into some real surprises for us in the future? It's hard to know exactly what to make of the reports of the sort of the insect Armageddon, um, as it's been called. It seems clear that at least in isolated areas in particular studies that the population drops have been unbelievably dramatic, you know, in some places as much as 75% in just a couple of decades. It's a little bit hard for me to believe that those numbers would hold up at the global scale, just because I think we would have already seen quite dramatic, catastrophic, cascading impacts from that if there really were 75% less insects than there were 20 years ago. But I also think that it's not something to be blithe about because those drops could come soon. So even if we've only lost, say, 20% of all insects on the planet, that's dramatic enough, and we're going to be continuing to imperil their future. That could make things really, really bad, especially for um, for plant growth, since so many plants depend on insects for pollination. The mammal numbers are perhaps even more startling. The World Wildlife Foundation says that I think 50% of all vertebrate mammals have died since 1970. That's just an astonishing number. This is We've had mass extinctions on the planet before. We've had five of them. Nothing has ever happened at nearly the speed that we're going through now because nothing has ever changed the climate of the planet nearly as dramatically or nearly as quickly as we are doing today. So when you hear from kind of climate skeptics or climate deniers, well, the planet's been this hot before, it's been through transitions like this before, that is true, but the transitions were much, much, much slower, literally unfolding over millions of years when we're now talking about years and decades, but also never before in the history of humanity. So the animal life of the planet was wiped almost entirely clean, and the biology started almost from scratch every time. That's what we mean when we say mass extinction, and that is what we're living through right now. So what that means for human life, because we're an adaptable species, I really don't think there's much chance that we go extinct anytime soon. But the kind of transformation that we're looking at when we have half of all animal life dying, if we have three quarters of all insect life dying, in addition to all of the impacts on agriculture from sea level, from public health, economic growth, conflict, all those things, When you add these things up, it is just an awe-inspiring spectacle of devastation, and that is the story that we're walking into now. Now, we're still the protagonist of that story. These things are not outside of our control, and in fact, the flip side of the scale of just what kind of horrors are possible, 
is that we are that powerful. If we can bring four degrees of warming over the course of, you know, 70 years, that means we can avert four degrees of warming over the course of 70 years because all of the inputs are in our control. The only thing we lack is the will to take action. So I'm hopeful that by raising the alarm, by talking about some of the scarier things that are likely to happen, more people will be motivated to avert them. And there are a lot of reasons, you know, to think we won't be able to take action quickly enough. But I'm hopeful that we'll take action quickly nevertheless and do whatever we can to avert some of the most catastrophic outcomes that are not just imaginable, but quite likely if we keep heading where we're headed. Well, let's lighten up to the trivial. You wrote in your book about a lot of the burning has happened since the premiere of Seinfeld. And one of my favorite Seinfeld lines comes from Elaine after throwing a valuable fur coat out a window. She says, I guess I have to buy him a new coat, even though I don't think I should be held responsible, which I am anyway. And I'm sort of applying that argument, perhaps, to the United States. I love the United States. Most of my listeners are in the United States. But the fact is that the great burden of carbon that's been laid out into the atmosphere came from the United States. What do you think about the argument that countries who prospered by filling the sky with carbon should now pay the most to try and avoid this coming catastrophe? Will that ever fly in the U.S.? The moral logic of it is inarguable. When I think especially about the climate impacts that are already pummeling Saudi Arabia, which um, has developed over the last few decades largely as an American petro-client state, or what's scheduled to happen in India and Bangladesh, where in India many of the biggest cities are going to become unlivably hot as soon as the middle of the of this century, and Bangladesh, most of the most populous parts of the country, will flood because of climate change by the middle of the century. Those were colonies of Britain, which is the nation that invented uh, the Industrial Revolution, for which we have all this to thank. As I say, I think the moral logic of that perspective is inarguable. How it plays out practically, I don't really know. And I think that's one of the big questions for the coming decades is, how do we develop a geopolitics around carbon and around climate change that puts front and center some of these questions, the issues of climate reparation, who will pay for the adaptation measures that are necessary, the mitigation measures that are necessary, who will accommodate the climate refugees, who will bring them into the fold. You know, there are reasons to to worry about the answers to those questions. It's hard to start to talk about them because I think we haven't yet developed anything like the geopolitical framework in which they will be answered. If you think about the 20th century, we developed an entire international order around the principle of human rights and peace, and to a lesser extent, perhaps, prosperity powered by market forces, which may not have been um, as good in the end as it seemed at the time. But coming out of World War II, we really fashioned a whole new global order built on these principles. I think in the 21st century, we're going to see a global order fashioned around the principle of carbon and climate change. What that looks like, who is in charge, who polices, who pays, I don't know. That'll all come out in the wash. But I think we are, um, we're entering into an entirely new political era, and the answers to these questions will be put forward in that context rather than the one that we're um, emerging from now, which is one reason why I think the Paris Accords, as noble as they were, as much as I'd like to see them succeed, I, I think you have to count them at least at this stage as a failure. Um, and that's a sign that the, the liberal international order that presided, especially since the end of the Cold War, but in ways since the end of World War II, is maybe not up to the task of this challenge. I mean, we'll see. It may rebound. We may have renewed investment and renewed commitment to um, globalization and, and the principle of global cooperation. But it is startling to think that while you, could, you almost couldn't imagine a threat to the planet bigger or more important than climate change, one that would more naturally call into being the forces of cooperation that were embodied in institutions like the UN and the EU, we're seeing a crisis come about with climate at a time when so many nations of the world, including the U.S., and the U.K. are retreating from those obligations, are retreating from those organizations, and really having, you know, assuming a kind of go-it-alone mentality. What that means for where we'll be 10 years from now, I can't say. You know, again, as someone who is really a child of the end of history in the 90s in America, I want to see those institutions return, but it may be that we have to fashion new ones and new principles to address the scale of the threat that we face. I totally agree with you, and I've been looking at things like the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the Revolution in China, and thinking, well, maybe we will have a climate revolution. And my other thoughts are, you've written that the Paris Climate Accords are looking more and more like a fantasy, and I I agree with that for sure. 
But we are seeing more local action with city mayors aiming for carbon neutral status. And uh, maybe a top down solution won't be possible, but that doesn't mean we completely fail. Well, my feeling is that there needs to be some top down action, um, that the effort by individuals and even communities, they just don't add up as quickly as they would if they were organized into large scale political action. So I think that politics on some level has to be the answer. Asking everyone to eat meat out of the goodness of their heart is, um, and their concern for the planet, I think you're going to get some converts there. But I also think that um, the numbers are just going to be, the impact is going to be much, much smaller than if you could make some major policy changes that rebuild our choice architecture so that when we are making choices about, say, what to eat or where to travel, that we're doing so in among a, a buffet of choices, none of which are as irresponsible as the ones that we make today. Um, I think that has to be, that is the role for politics and policy, and there's no other way around it. So, right, don't take your whole wedding party to Fiji for fun because you're killing the planet. We've got to be able to tell our friends that. So your new book isn't just a summary of climate science. What is the other big story you're trying to tell? You've been giving us a lot of it in this interview, but I think that it's important to really outline that there's something else in this book that we need. You know, I'm trying to establish a whole new inquiry into the future of humanity in a time of climate change. So I think of it really as the humanities of climate change. Um, We know the science. We know well enough how it will impact us in terms of what it will mean for hurricanes and what it will mean for droughts and what it will mean for famines. What we really haven't begun to think about is all of the other ways beyond science that it will will change our lives, change our orientation towards the planet, change our, our understanding of our place in history, whether history marks a course of progress or something else. And I really do believe that we're entering into a new era that will be governed by this totally, that will be governed by climate change totally. It will be the meta narrative of the 21st century, and we won't be able to escape it wherever we look. What that means for our culture, what it means for our child rearing choices, what it means for our relationship to our phones. Um, All of these are basically unasked questions, but they ultimately are a map of our future on this planet, because whatever climate suffering comes to pass, whatever we do in terms of damaging the planet further and imposing more punishments on our future generations, it will still be the case that there will be humans around living, and they will not be living preoccupied totally by the forces of climate change. They will be preoccupied by the same things that you and I are preoccupied by. The question is, how will climate change affect those concerns? How will it change our orientation? And how will it um, rebuild our future in ways beyond the narrow impacts of science? And that's like that's the great theme of my book, I think. We've been talking with David Wallace-Wells from New York Magazine. His new book, The Uninhabitable Earth, should be a bestseller about our hotter future. I will put links in my weekly show blog at ecoshock.org. David, thank you for sharing your time with us. Thank you so much. Check out the Radio Ecoshock website. We're at ecoshock.org.